Hello, best ever listeners. Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Ash Patel, and I'm with today's guest, Edward Brown. Edward is joining us from Novoto, California. He was a CEO of a hard money loan company, an expert witness, and a writer for many years. Edward's current role is raising capital for real estate mortgage funds for Pacific private money. Edward, thank you for joining us. And how are you today? Excellent, Ash. Thank you for having me as, yeah, as a guest today. Hey, it's our pleasure. Edward, before we get started, can you give the best ever listeners a little bit more about your background and what you're focused on now? Yeah. So I, I have a bachelor's degree in accounting and a master's degree in tax. And for many years, I had my own tax and financial consulting business with uh, real estate license, investment license, uh, uh, tax preparation license, and insurance license. Uh, certified fund specialist. I had, you know, I had a lot of uh, deg degrees and uh, certificates. And uh, back in 1991, I think it was, is when I started getting involved in uh, real estate mortgages, uh, either buying discounted ones or originating and uh, started my own hard money loan business uh, back uh, in the early 90s and was CEO. And uh, you know what? I I don't like being CEO. I just, I actually like sales. I've always been a good salesman. So um, I decided back in 2000, actually 2009, I was uh, a, a co-host of a radio show uh, in the San Francisco Bay area. And, and then in 2010, I started my own show uh, with Mark Hahn, president of Pacific Private Money. And for three years, we never did any business together. All we did was just strictly radio. And then in 2013, he decided he wanted to start his first fund. And he knew that I knew a lot about funds. So he asked me to help him start it up. And I said, you know what, Mark, only because it's you. And I've gotten to know you well enough over the last few years that I, I think you're, you're fairly trustworthy. And uh, so as long as I can have some input with regard to you know, how to investors get out, what's the holding period, how are your interests aligned, uh, I said, I'd be glad to help you out. So uh, since 2013, I've been primarily helping him raise money for four different funds. And can you explain to us what a mortgage fund is? Yeah, imagine it's like a mutual fund, but instead of buying stocks and bonds, uh, we have real estate mortgages. So they're mortgages backed by real estate. Effectively, we're the bank. So it's a diversified pool of real estate mortgages. Do you originate the mortgages or do you purchase them? Generally, we do originate them. Um, we're, we believe that we may be the largest in the country for originating uh, from a private ca capital standpoint, owner-occupied consumer bridge loans. So there are a lot of fix and flip lenders out there, but there aren't too many who actually do the origination due to Dodd-Frank and all that. Uh, primarily, I think it's because it's a pretty expensive barrier of entry, and we decided to spend the money to get into that. And between all of our uh, funds, we'll probably do about a billion dollars this year. What are those barriers to entry? Uh, it's very expensive with regard to uh, the licensing, the legal, the software, the continuing education. Uh, it could range, I don't know, probably upwards $100,000. And if you're a typical fix and flip lender and you're successful at what you do, why would you want to spend that money to enter a new space and learn the whole thing and, and, and get involved with the, you know, the attorneys, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we decided to make that leap uh, some years back and it's been very profitable. So Edward, a lot of banks don't typically like to lend to fix and flippers. They don't like the short term quick hits. Um, so it's usually private money that they use, right? Uh, yes. And actually with us, the same kind of thing with regard to bridge loans, because our bridge loans last less than a year and our typical duration is only about four to six months. Um, the reason it's profitable for us is because we do charge points up front. So we've done loans where it's been paid back, where a loan has been paid back in as little as a week, which, you know, then we've got to put the money back out again. But if you're charging points, it's pretty profitable to us. Yeah. What's a typical loan run a consumer through your company? Uh, the interest rate that we charge the borrowers? Interest uh, rate in points in terms. Okay. So uh, generally speaking, because interest rates have gone up now, we are charging in the high nine and a half to 10% range uh, for a first mortgage, uh, usually no less than or no higher than 70% loan to value. 
and typically one and a half to two points. Depends on the size of the loan. But but now let me let me clarify that because we have done loans where the uh, loan to value has been a hundred percent, but we've had cross collateral on the existing house, so our cumulative loan to value is less than seventy percent. Interesting. So will you cross collateralize other assets? Yeah, uh, just real estate. Oh, right. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so that Correct. can really help investors. A- abs- absolutely. Yeah. The whole idea is don't lose money. You know, that, that's always been my, my mantra in, uh, in, in helping with these funds. And to, so far, uh, now Pacific Private Money started in 2008. But if you remember what was going on in 2009, 10, and 11, the, the real estate market was still going down. And yet no investors lost any money. Uh, we hadn't started our fund until 2013. But individual clients did not lose any money. Who's your competition? Every other private lender out there? Generally, no. Uh, in we, Our main focus is California, but we are expanding outside of California. In California, there's only a handful of lenders who will do owner-occupied consumer bridge loans, again, because of the barriers of entry, I believe. Um, we actually work really well with other lenders because there's some, you know, we're not as competitive, let's say, in the typical fix and flip market. And so we'll refer that out to other uh, hard money lenders. So we're, there's not that much competition for us. And it's, it's crazy how we have so much demand for our product now. And we've actually had, it's interesting, we've got some clients to call and, and be a little concerned about how things are going in the real estate market. But the, the fact is, even though there are some contracts that are being canceled by purchasers, the refinance market has uh, slowed considerably. And so there are a lot of mortgage companies who have laid off employees. So we're now we're becoming like a bigger fish in a smaller pond, so to speak. Who is your ideal customer? Uh, somebody who owns a home, who wants to make a competitive offer on another property and doesn't want to move twice and has a lot of equity in their current house. Well, you want shorter term loans, right? So yes. you, you basically want to bridge a gap. Correct. Okay. And who's your ideal investor and what kind of returns do your investors see? Okay. Our, our, generally, our, uh, our, our clients are going to be ones who are looking for monthly income. You know, the very, very simple uh, conservative people who just want a monthly income who can go to sleep at night. Uh, all of our funds are uh, requiring accredited investors. Um, we're mostly pushing our freedom fund because that's where we have the biggest demand for uh, need of money. Um, so there is a $250,000 minimum. We do have some flexibility to take less capital uh, than that, but generally we're trying to keep at the 250 mark. And at 250,000, uh, clients can get 7%. Uh, at 500,000, they get 8%. And at, at a million or more, they get 9%. The best part of this is it's fairly liquid. So uh, we're only requiring a 30-day notice if people want their money back. And the reason that we can uh, uh, perform that for them is because the uh, primary focus of that fund is to do these loans where we package them up and sell them to the big boys. I say sell them to Wall Street, not necessarily Wall Street, but they're large institutions. So a few years ago, we put a hundred million dollar securitization offering together. And then as these loans get paid off fairly quickly, because again, who wants to pay us nine and a half percent interest when they have an 800 FICO score and they can qualify for you know five or 6%, right? So the money comes back to us every roughly two to three weeks and then we ask, is it, you know, has anybody put a request for redemption? And if they have, then we cash them out. If not, put it back on the conveyor belt and do another loan. Okay. So how do you package this up and sell it to an institution if they're all short-term loans? Because these institutions really like our product. I mean, we had to go through extensive due diligence uh, with these companies for, I, I believe like for at least a year where they looked up and down us uh, very carefully to make sure that we, our due diligence was good there, you know, on, on doing the loans. And then they did due diligence on us. Um, so they like the fact that these are very conservative loans because the uh, risk of them going into default is very low. 
Um, and so as the loans pay off, then we have to uh, backfill them with new loans. Um, so their investors are going to get anywhere from a four to 6% return is, is how they're selling it. In the back of my mind, it begs the question, why not start a bank where you can pay 1% interest to people and loan out the money at a factor of 10 or yep. 9%? Because banks have their own special regulations and there are certain rules that you have to follow. Uh, we have a little bit of wiggle room from the standpoint that we will follow regulations, but we don't have reserve requirements. We don't have to worry about the Fed coming in and saying, you know, you got to put this loan on the watch list because uh, the FICO score is three points below what we like to see. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's been a better way for us to just go out and into the private capital and raise money. And if you're paying investors seven to 9%, you guys are on fairly thin margin. So those points really come into play here. Absolutely. Especially when we're turning the money over every three weeks or so. Yeah. So that's why we can And it's very interesting. We, I, about a three or four weeks ago, I had a, uh, a new client call up and say, you know, I've been watching you guys getting your newsletters and talking to people uh, for, for two years and I never did any business with you, but I like what you have to say about these, this freedom fund. And I'd like to come in and write a check for a million dollars to, to get that 9%. Because we just recently instituted that 9% uh, at that rate. Son of a gun, if I didn't meet him in person, he liked what I had to say. And he wrote a check right on the spot for 3 million. And then four days later, he called up and he said, you know, I really do like this thing. Can I add another million to it? So the guy hadn't even received his first check yet. And he's got 4 million with us. Um, and we've had people who have put in requests for a million dollar redemption. And depending upon when we're in the cycle of that three week period, we've been able to redeem people in as little as four days. So can you imagine having uh, an interest rate, or you're earning an interest rate of anywhere from seven to nine percent. And it's almost like a money market account, except there's no check writing privileges and you have to give us 30 days notice. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great fund. I, I love the liquidity. But yeah. they're getting taxed at ordinary income, right? Or at their tax rate? Uh, yes, they are. But we do qualify for QBID. All of our funds qualify for QBID. So if the client is uh, qualified uh, where their income is, uh, I can't remember if it's 315000 or they may have changed the rules on that. But that was a law that was uh, passed a few years ago where uh, if uh, income that we pay uh, potentially is not taxed on 100%, but only on 80% of it. So there's a little bit of a tax break if the uh, uh, investor qualifies in that. And you can't, unfortunately, people call up and say, hey, can I 1031 exchange into your funds? Unfortunately not, because again, it's a mortgage pool fund. And Edward, what is your bottleneck right now? Is it lack of clients or investors or lack of people to loan money to? Right now, we are still in a position where we can use all the capital um, we can get our hands on. Uh, we've expanded quite a bit with regard to brokers. Uh, there are a lot of people out there, realtors, brokers, who don't even know that our product exists. And when we've done presentations to realtors and they say, holy smokes, I didn't know that I, I could get my client this bridge loan. I thought I had to sell his property first to go buy another one. Uh, so we think that we've got in the pipeline at any point in time, about 15 million a week in loans to, to, to fill. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we raised our interest rates to our investors. Uh, there was a time about a year ago, we were just paying a flat 6%. But, you know, in order to attract money, and especially when interest rates are going up, uh, you got to pay a little bit more. So we are working on a thinner margin, but we are definitely, we're not losing money for sure, because we're obviously we're charging more than even 9% plus the points. And then uh, we, the volume uh, uh, turnover is very, very quick. So we're, we're doing very well. Do you lend to investors on commercial properties? We do. That's not our, our major uh, ob objective, uh, but it's a deal by deal basis. So uh, we'll, we'll look at that. We'll, we'll also do second mortgages, but again, it's got to make sense. So it, there are some 
second mortgages that are actually more conservative than first mortgages, depending upon how big the first is and, and the fair market value of the property. So we will do some commercial. Uh, we kind of stay away from like strip malls and stuff like that, uh, you know, or uh, cemeteries or really odd type, you know, we, we'll do some multifamily, uh, you know, th there's somewhat plain vanilla, but every deal is a little different. All right. So I am a non-residential commercial investor. Uh -huh. I do strip malls, office buildings, uh -huh. industrial. Um, what's the most amount of money you would lend to one client, one person? Uh, so the, uh, the big boys who are buying our loans, uh, will not allow, uh, they will not accept a loan that's larger than uh, ma maximum 3 million per investor. Uh, but if we put in one of our other funds, I think we've lent over 5 million. Uh, we potentially could lend more, but we just haven't had a request. Actually, you know what? I take that back. I take that back. I, I believe that we actually did a $40 million loan. I wasn't involved in this one. A uh, $40 million loan in New York uh, for some uh, multifamily, uh, you know, from, from, for an apartment building. Yeah. So if, um, and you won't do strip malls at all? Uh, no, I wouldn't say we won't do that. Again, we'll have to really scrutinize it to decide if it uh, fits within our criteria. You know, we want to, uh, we're mostly underwriting the property uh, rather than the borrower. Um, and then again, if there's cross collateral, we'll look at that. Um, but, you know, the loan to value. So we, we'll analyze it. Um, we may not be as competitive as other companies, but we'll look at it. So I'll go easy on you. Let's say there's a multifamily person who is contractually obligated to close within 10 days, 20 uh -huh. days, and his loan's not going to come in for 45. Yeah. His appraisal, how about this? His appraisal is not going to come in for 45. Okay. Uh, and they need $2 million in 20 days. Mm -hmm. Is that something you could do? And what, what parameters would you look at? Uh, on commercial, we may be going down to like 60% loan to value. So, you know, we'll look at the rent rolls, you know, we'll do kind of typical underwriting that any hard money lender would do on that. Um, hard to say where, where it depends on where the property is also. Uh, so we'll look at that again, deal by deal basis. And if we can't do the, the, the loan, we'll usually suggest another lender. Got it. Yeah. Awesome. What's, what's one of the hardest lessons you've learned in all of your years in real estate? Uh, boy, I tell you, because I know one of these questions uh, comes up about uh, losing money. I, I like to stay away from land deals and mostly because there are so many political things that go on, especially in California, where you can't control uh, the, you know, where the wind's going to blow one day and uh, you get held up and time just it works against you. So I personally like to stay away from uh, development type deals. If you can go back in time, what would you do differently as it pertains to real estate and business? Well, one, I would stay away from land deals. <laughs> uh oh, you got burned on one, huh? Uh, oh, I got burned uh, in the in the seven figures. On, on oh. it. Yeah, so uh, it, it it's it's one of those. That's that's uh, been a, a very challenging lesson. Um, and, and if I could actually kind of expand on that, it was at the time back in 2006, you know, six, seven, eight, when uh, the banks were giving money away like water. So uh, when I was CEO of my, my own hard money loan business, it was harder to find deals because we couldn't compete with the banks. And the banks, again, it was too easy to qualify with them in a fairly timely basis. So uh, we expanded our... Um, uh, horizon, so to speak. And, and we got caught in some land deals, uh, even though you'd look at it and say, you know, how can you lose on this? Well, unfortunately, there were some some unknowns in there. Uh, so I, I, that to me, again, uh, now that that being said, um, I, I actually have been associated with a land deal in Texas uh, that has worked out very well. So how can you mitigate land deals to minimize the risk of exposure? Uh, get as much cross collateral as possible. Yeah, because even though you get uh, personal guarantees, a lot of times that's just um, uh, an afterthought, you know, because then you have to go to judicial foreclosure. It takes so much time. There's just too many other things that can go involved. You really have to underwrite the property. What went wrong on the land deal? Just timing? uh market conditions mostly mostly market conditions yeah, yeah. 
And then what ends up happening is the, uh, in, specifically in California and in certain counties, you know, you try to go back to the county and say, look, this property isn't worth nearly what our loan is. The market has dropped out. And um, until you can produce a comp sale, not, not even the fact that, look, we're trying to sell this for 10 cents on the dollar and there's no offers, they, the county uh, doesn't accept that. They want to see an actual closed transaction. And so you, can, you actually end up losing property because the real estate taxes are too high. That's insane. It is. Well, that's again, a, that's to, a tough one. To, welcome to uh, California. I know. Uh, yeah. Um, interesting. And thanks for sharing that story. Yeah. Um, if somebody wants to get into hard money lending, what's your advice to them? Uh, one thing I would uh, caution people about is doing fractionalized deeds, especially if uh, that person does not have more than 50%. And again, I know this from experience because we had some deals where we did fractionalize in my old company, not Pacific Five Money, but my old company, we did fractionalized deeds. And when, when things are going great, everybody's happy. But when, when things start to go down and you have to foreclose, now you're a part owner with you know, 10 people, six people, four people, 20 people, depending upon you know, the licensing you have uh, with being able to do fractionalized deeds. And trying to, you know, herd cats is difficult. And uh, even though it's funny, we, even though our my old company, we actually had documents that people signed and powers of attorney that people signed, the title companies just said, we don't care what your documents say, unless you can get the person to physically come in and sign with a notary for, for doing, you know, allowing you to make the decision or signing off on a deal, uh, we don't accept it. Well, sure enough, we'd had a couple of people who held us up. And there was, and, and so then, you know, now you're talking lawsuits and, and all this other kind of stuff. So it's, uh, I would say either as, a, as an individual investor, if you want to uh, do a hard money loan with a broker, because you don't want to uh, get involved with usury, uh, take the entire loan yourself. Um, it's getting diff- more difficult though, because funds like ours, that in fact, that's one of the reasons we started a fund to begin with, not our freedom fund, but our regular Pacific Private Money Fund, was we would get a request for a smoking hot deal that we had to close in 10 days. And before I helped Mark start his first fund, he was just acting as a hard money loan broker. So he had, you know, maybe 50 clients at the time and he'd take, send out a blast email to these 50 clients say, I got this smoking hot deal. It's, you know, $400,000 on a million dollar property. They got to close in such and such time, you know, 10 days, you know, all this great stuff. Right. And within, let's say an hour, he had maybe four or five clients say that, okay, I've looked at this. This looks really good. I want it. And it's like, uh, uh oh, uh, so one guy got it and the other four or five people were told, I'm sorry, you're too late. Well, it doesn't take too many of those situations to where you start getting upset clients. And I myself was experiencing that as a high net worth individual investor with other brokers uh, where they were doing that. I, I remember answering an email in 17 seconds because I could analyze it really, really quickly and say, I want that deal. And I was told I was too late. So a lot of these loans are being swooped up by funds like ours, because we had to start a fund in order to not get too many upset clients to where we could start raising money. And the fund is, has first crack at the loan. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Edward, are you ready for the best ever lightning round? Yes. All right. What's the best ever book you recently read? Absolutely. I believe, you know, I know it's going to sound cliche, but it's absolutely the Bible because it is a living I actually kind of wrote a little note here <laughs> uh, because it's a, it's, it's a living book. And each time you read it, God speaks to you, uh, teaching you things you hadn't seen before and making it relevant in your life. So it, it's sort of like watching a movie where the, it, the, it kind of keeps changing all the time. So I, I have to go with the Bible. And Edward, what's the best ever way you like to give back? 
Um, I like giving free advice. Uh, one of the things I remember doing is uh, meeting this guy in the gym one time. And when he knew I did uh, real estate loans, he said, oh, yeah, there's a friend of mine who's who needs, uh, you know, a second mortgage on his house. And uh, we, we both agreed that I was going to charge him 12 percent. And, you know, it's a really safe loan, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, listen, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not giving you any legal advice, but I would like you to talk to a real estate attorney and ask him what the usury laws are. Because if I'm not mistaken, I mean, I knew what the rules were, but I want to make it very, very clear that I was not giving him legal advice. I said, uh, there are some serious challenges that happen if you charge more than 10% and you don't use a licensed uh, mortgage broker. And so yeah. I saw him about a week later and he said, Edward, thank you so much. He said that my attorney hundred percent agreed with you and he told me what the legal ramifications were. So it, it's kind of, I like giving free advice like that. And what, so how do all these other hard money lenders get away with going above and beyond? Uh, well, if you're licensed, then the usury rules don't apply. How many of them are licensed? Oh, I think most of them are. Uh, for, for the hard money lenders, yeah, uh, I, I would think most of them are. I mean, that if, especially if you're advertising, I mean, you're playing with fire. Uh, and oh, here's the funny thing: is that most, you know, rates are now starting to go uh, back up. Like, you know, three years ago when interest rates were low, you didn't have to worry about it because nobody was charging ten percent. Now the rates are starting to go back up. But um, I, I would, I would, I would, just, I would presume that most people are licensed. I would tell you that in the Midwest, most people that I know that get hard money loans, they're not from licensed people. They're from individuals just doing loans. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, again, like my, my friend who, uh, who I talked about, and I don't know if that's a federal law or state by state. I, I don't either. I know uh, in Ohio, uh, usury laws can be overcome by lending to an LLC, like one LLC to another. Gotcha. Um, but again, yeah, again, I'm not an attorney and I don't know yeah, all the rules. Listen, I just, all I the best ever listeners you. don't listen to <laughs> us. There's no legal advice. We're just popping ideas back and forth. Yeah. Finally, Edward, how can the best ever listeners reach out to you? Uh, best way is just my simple email, edward at Pacific private money.com. Awesome. Edward, I got to thank you for your time today. You gave us some great incense, some great insight into hard money loans starting funds, helping people with bridge loans, and a potential great way to stay liquid and earn a high interest rate. So thank you for all of your time today. Ash, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Best ever listeners, thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review. Share this episode with someone you think can benefit from it. Also, follow, subscribe, and have a best ever day.